Sermon 108 from True Love Chapel here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, my name is Richard. You can email me, richard at truelovechapel.com. If you have any questions, I'll try to get back to you. Sometimes uh, it might take a while, but I'll try. Um, it's, it's extremely important to me to get back to the people um, who are interested in True Love Chapel, but uh, please forgive me for being so insanely busy. Um, that's just the way life is sometimes, but uh, you know, we always have time for the things that we want to have time for. So I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have to uh, try harder to make time for that stuff. And, uh, you know, for answering questions and all. But anyway, uh, we're going to be in the book of Acts following the reading plan. You can check us out, truelovechapel.com. Find out about what we're doing. We're in the uh, New King James Version this year following a reading plan, taking us through the New Testament. You're on your own for the Old Testament. You can read it or not. You know, I hope that you would. Um, I suggested a good audio Bible and just let it play, let it run. And uh, as background while you're doing something else, working out, cleaning in the house, whatever it is. And uh, but then we follow the uh, reading assignments for the New Testament and uh, <clears throat> bring us to the book of Acts. And uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter four today, just the first four verses. But uh, I have a little bit to say about some of the other stuff by way of introduction so let's just go and uh, pray and we'll, we'll jump into it almighty god thank you for this sermon thank you for the bible study please uh give me your blessing give me your anointing help me to speak the truth and the words that you want me to to uh, present and uh please open up our hearts to uh, receive the message that you have for us and to draw closer to jesus we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> first, let's, uh, well, let's just first talk about Acts. So uh, Acts was uh, written by Luke, and it was another one of these books where the author doesn't necessarily give his uh, name. But thank God for the uh, scholars who have uh, figured it out for us that it was Luke. Um, <clears throat> Luke, who also wrote the book, the gospel book of Luke, and that book also doesn't not list the author's name. But we figured it out, scholars did, um, in a number of ways. One is uh, through the, uh, the we sections of Acts, where he's talking about Paul and himself. We went here, we went there. So, I mean, we had to have been a companion of Paul's and... Um, on his trips to these various places, so that narrows it down, um, narrows it down to Luke, and uh, early church, uh, early church tradition also supports Luke as the author of both of these books. The Gospel, Gospel of Luke was written uh, first. Book of Acts was written second. Acts chapter one, verse one, is talking about the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He's talking about the former account of the gospel of Luke. Now, Luke was, he was not one of the disciples. He was not one of the apostles. He was just simply one of the uh, early guys. He was actually a physician and he was a historian. And uh, he was not an eyewitness to Jesus's ministry, though he certainly did a very diligent job of collecting the information from the eyewitnesses and compiling it with the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit to write out the, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And Acts, of course, is a very unique book in the Bible, being a New Testament history book of the early church. History of the early church, that's extremely like important. Christianity is a, something, it deserves to, to be known what the early history was, because it's so amazing and so fascinating the way it just exploded and uh, they just took over the, the ancient world there, turned the whole world upside down, uh, non-violently, right? Peacefully they did this. <clears throat> but um, so Luke, he was very detailed. I mentioned he was a historian, um, you know, he was a physician and a historian. He, uh, he, he obviously kept very 
meticulous records. I mean, especially the book of Acts, it's very, it's very detailed on like names and places and things like that. So it's stuff that's verifiable. I mean, they're talking about actual places and people that existed in history. And uh, archaeologists can and have found those civilizations and verified that the book of Acts is talking about real places and real peoples that existed in those times. So that's powerful. And um, <clears throat> um, book of Acts is a unique book also and because of the there's a, a number of these uh, sermons that are present there. Quite a few sermons. Um, I think it's like a third of the book or something is all ser sermonic. So that's cool. And uh, also <clears throat> in the early parts of Acts, you know, chapter 2, we're talking about the, the early church. You know, chapter 2, verse 40, it says, uh, And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Um, then those who uh, gladly received his word and were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Uh huh. And it goes on, it says, uh, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and good, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So the early church was one where people really sacrificed all that they had to come to Christ. And including all of their possessions, they did not consider it as their own. They wanted, they wanted to give everything to the church. And then the church was able to make sure that everyone who had need had their needs met. Now, how powerful is that? That's extremely not like um, what's happening today. Um, I mean, you could contrast what's happening in the world with what happened there. And... Uh, then you'll have a real contrast. Uh, look, you know, not even the, if you compare the world today, not, not the church, just the world in general, versus uh, the early church, <clears throat> you have stark night and day contrast. One, they, they gave everything they had to share with the others. Two, today um, I, was, I was reading an article um, this past week, I think, and uh, in the modern times, I hear that uh, now they say the 41 richest people in the world have the same money as the poorest half of the world. Okay, that's insane. And uh, when I started my first sermon, not the first True Love Chapel sermon, but my first sermon sermon back in Bible college, uh, that one I was talking about that subject also and back then i believe it was 80 people or 85 or something had the same money as half now we're down to 40 41 i think it was and so what and it just the divide just continues to grow the rich keep getting richer the poor keep getting poorer and um you know where does it stop what eventually one person is going to have as much money as four billion poor people i mean how is that anything how, you just can't even wrap your head around that why would anyone want to be in that position me i don't i don't think that that's a good thing at all to have that much money at least not if it's all for yourself now if you're going to have a bunch of money and start a bunch of businesses and put a bunch of people to work and uh, treat them fairly and all that maybe you know that might be something better but if it's all for yourself that is just shameful, you know, shameful. We got people dying every second around the world of starvation and everything, extreme poverty. And, uh, and so what are you going to do with a hundred billion dollars or whatever it is? Um, it, and it's just sitting in the bank just for nothing, for just for you. It's ridiculous. It's sick, especially sick when, in a, when the world itself has enough resources to provide i mean to to meet everyone's needs the world has the resources for it but it's the greedy people in the world who are hogging all that stuff for themselves and letting just the multitudes just die of starvation it's a really sickening uh thing happening in the world and so that is the complete opposite of the picture we see in the bible of the the new testament 
the church, the early church, which is sort of, I mean, it, you decide, you know, you decide. So we go on to our, uh, <clears throat> our passage, chapter 4, the first four verses. Let me read it. It says, uh, <clears throat> by the way, this is right after they had just, uh, Peter and John had just healed a guy who was sick, um, was it since birth or at least for many years, the, the guy at uh, Solomon's Portico. So they just healed a guy, they did miracle, and then, and then they're getting arrested. So this is Peter and John arrested. And it says, uh, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Oh, wow. So here we go again. 5,000. Um, <clears> we had just read 3,000 in uh, chapter 2, verse 41. Also in chapter 1, verse 15, it mentions 120 people. Chapter uh, 1, verse 15, <clears throat> this is about, it says, in those, um, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether the number of names was about 120. So th that was the disciples, not the original 12, but now it's, it's grown. We're talking about after, uh, you know, well, this is the coming of the Pentecost. So anyway, it started off. The book of Acts starts off talking about 120 followers of Christ. Then in chapter 2, we got 3,000 that got saved. And then in chapter 4, just now, we said many who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. That was a different culture back then. So they didn't count the women and children. They counted the men. So if you got a, that's, you know, 8,120 men that we're just talking about here. And, um, and then not even counting the women and children. So it's probably about 10,000 people we're looking at. 10,000 people would be my best estimation for the first, um, what is this? We'll just say the first month. I mean, this is. Not all happening on the same day, I, I don't think. This was um, probably some weeks apart. But within the first month, you got 10,000 believers of Christ. And it could have been the first couple of weeks. Now that right there is, is significant, that, that type of growth. How do you get 10,000 people to agree on anything? Especially when it means that they have to um, give up all that they had in the world, including their status in society and all that. Um, it's a miracle, you know, it's a miracle. And to do this non-violently, and um, <clears throat> it's and nothing like that has ever happened before. That's it. That is massive. I mean, even in, even in court today, you know, a witness has value in court today. Two witnesses has more value especially when you can examine them separately and see if their stories contradict or if they, they uh, collaborate. You know, and uh, by two or three witnesses, a matter is established. But say you have 10,000 witnesses, 10,000 people who are turning their back on the world and turning to Christ. That's incredible. That is powerful. No wonder we still talk about Christianity to this day. I mean, it's the most, it's the single most, um, well, I mean, I say that in kind of a silly way, but, but it, it is obviously the single most biggest um, thing to ever happen in humanity is uh, the resurrection of Christ, the growth of the church, the testimony of the saints, and it's the Holy Spirit working through those people. You know, if, if there wasn't a day of Pentecost, I don't think you would have had 3,000 people there, but they had seen the, the miracle for themselves how they were able to speak in all those languages. And so they, uh, they, they were convicted of their sin and they drawn to Christ. 
So we go to chapter 4 again, verse uh, 1. It says, uh, talking about Peter and John, they're speaking to the people. And uh, it says, The priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Well, they did say Sadducees, didn't they? Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in resurrection at all. And uh, <clears throat> so there's a, a false presupposition where they assume to know the answer before seeing the evidence. And, uh, and then whatever evidence they see that doesn't fit in their preformed worldview is automatically rejected. So that's, that's a foolish thing and that's very common uh, with human nature to where people, uh, they sort of believe what they want to believe rather than what the actual facts are saying. So Christianity believes in the facts and follows the facts. All the facts are pointing to Christianity. And I, I mention often about the, uh, the apologetic evidence, the, uh, the miracles, the prophecy, the, the testimony of the witnesses, the, the eyewitnesses, the testimony of the saints and all that. But that's, that's facts, that's evidence. But to just say you, you don't believe it or you don't want to believe it, you don't choose a religion like you're ordering off a menu. Oh, that sounds good, uh, I'll pick that one. It, I mean, that's a very foolish way to go about your life. But here we have, so we have basically, it's a picture of the world coming against the, the truth. So. Peter and John, they're arrested for preaching the truth, proclaiming the truth. They were proclaiming that Christ has risen, and that's verifiable. The tomb was empty. That was irrefutable. Everyone knew about the resurrection by this time. Uh, it was not done in a corner somewhere. It was, like, it was common knowledge. They also um, worked a miracle. And the miracle also confirms their message. And so they had, they had it all going for them and to represent truth in that way. And then here comes the world coming against them. Now, in just this little short little passage here from verse 1 all the way to verse 6, we have no fewer than 11 people or groups of people that are coming against our, uh, our dear uh, disciples here, Peter and John. The 11, <clears throat> we have um, the opposition for groups. We have uh, the priests and the Sadducees in verse 1. And we have the, uh, the rulers, uh, excuse me, rulers, elders, scribes, and that's in verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, okay. So they had to have the trial the next day because the Sanhedrin was open in the morning, not in the evening. And then uh, we have the uh, others in the family of the high priest, verse 6, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And individuals, we have the captain of the temple, verse 1, who he talks about, yeah, the captain of the temple in verse 1, Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander. Altogether, you have 11 people or groups of people who are coming in against the disciples for what? For speaking the truth. And their truth is verifiable. They have a person who had just been healed. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> it was a lame man who was healed, okay, in uh, Solomon's portico. He was healed, the people saw it, and uh, the people believed. The, uh, and they're also preaching the resurrection, which was verifiable and, um, at that time. And, um, and even now, the resurrection is ver verifiable by the, uh, the eyewitness accounts and everything else. You know, they could have gone into the prophecy. If you look about his uh, sermon addressing the Sanhedrin, he talks about the Christ of Nazareth and all this. 
I mean, these are things that, that can be looked up in the prophecy from thousands of years. They have all the evidence on their side. They have truth on their side. And, uh, but in verse 3 it says, And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Laid hands on them means it, it was a violent, you know, it was a violent thing. And uh, <clears throat> also, uh, which one was it? When it says came upon them in verse 1, that, mean, that was uh, implying come suddenly upon them. So they sort of just out of nowhere just stormed upon them, just grabbed them, knocked them around. So we're going to throw you in jail. They threatened them, um, you know, and they threatened them more as you go throughout and read the rest of the story. But the point is, is that why, why, were, they, why were they being attacked? Well, they represented truth. They were being attacked for having an unapproved thought <laughs> or a belief in something true as though it may be, but a belief in something that was not actually uh, endorsed by the system of the world. That's all it was. And uh, true or not, the fact is, is they want to say that we're the leaders here. We're the ones in control. And you got to do what we say. And if you don't, if we, if you are preaching something that we don't like the idea, even the resurrection, the Sadducees didn't like that idea. So that was, that was an unapproved thought that they were having. You know what I mean? See what I'm saying? And I mean, it's, it's, it's just the same, it's the same thing today. It's the same thing. Nothing has changed really because really the world is in the control of the devil. And uh, Christians have broken free and we see the truth. We see the light, that glorious shining light of Christ. And we're able to see what's true and what's right and what's real. And so we don't believe uh, the lies of the world. And uh, that's the way it is when you have to be a Christian. You have to make a choice. Follow the world, follow Christ. You cannot have it both ways. Too, a lot of Christians, I mean, or a lot of people get tripped up on that point. They, maybe they like Christianity on some level. They like the idea of it. Makes them feel good to go to church. Makes them feel maybe not so guilty about some of the bad things they've been doing. But they still want to be a friend of the world, even though the Bible tells us that the friend of the world is enmity with God. It, it makes you an enemy of God. You're being an enemy of God if you're a friend of the world because the world is hostile toward God. And the world is hostile toward Christians too. So you're not going to be friendly with the world if you're acting at, like a Christian, like you're supposed to be. The world is going to reject you. They're going to surround you on all sides like these 11 people and groups of people that we're talking about here. And so, and I mean, the world has its message and you hear it. Day in and day out, don't we? It's nonstop. It's, it's the world's message telling you what you need to think, what you need to believe. You get it in music, TV, radio, movies, you know, books, magazines, newspapers. It's just the culture itself. You know, people, everything, everywhere. It's, it's, it's just permeated through the very fabric of our society is this this idea one is about money you know it's about um you know how trying to convince you that what you need is money that what you need to desire is wealth and uh power and uh various things but i mean there's so many different traps different ways of going about it but i remember like i started out saying you know if you're hogging all those resources to yourself that's not a good thing why should you desire to be rich? I think we should all desire, as Christians, we should desire not to be rich, but to live simple, normal, humble lives. And uh, if we have extra money somehow, that's great. And maybe you can do something good with it. You can, uh, like I say, open a business. You can uh, sponsor a church. You can do something, something good as a Christian. But you need to stop thinking that all that stuff is for yourself. But I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? The whole world is just set up 
the whole world is set up to trap you and to ensnare you and and that's it and uh, even if you do pursue that you're not gonna you're probably not gonna get very far along that that way I mean some do some do I mean you could ask yourself too how many of these people how many of the famous people that we see that in the media and all that that we're supposed to be like all starstruck over how many of those people do you think might have actually like sold their soul to the devil to get there because all of them have the same message and it's a message which is a hostile toward God it's against Christ it's about promiscuity uh, sleeping around it's about you know objectifying women it's about having money and power in greed and lust and all that and that is the message that the world is giving us just rapid fire da -da 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 -da, all the time okay well to be a Christian you have to reject that look at uh, Peter and John here they were not they were not convinced that nothing could convince them to change their mind because what they had seen is far greater they had witnessed Christ the risen Christ and they had uh, you know, they've worked the miracles. They have the infilling of the Holy Spirit. They have the indwelling of the Spirit of God in them. The life of Christ is manifest in these people. And they're gladly facing persecution. They gladly are arrested. Okay, when they, when they come up against the world like this, they stand for Christ. And even later on, you have the famous uh, saying, uh, we have to believe God rather than men. It says it uh, later on in this, but uh, <clears throat> it's just a it's just a great thing to think about uh, and to be aware of that as a Christian, yeah, the world's hostile against you, and but at the same time we have the truth on our side. We have the truth, okay. A lot of people don't know that, and, and it's a sad thing, you know, like all the, uh, the liberal colleges and things nowadays where the professors try to make jokes about Christianity like it's a laughing stock and all, all this and that, like people are just believing in fairy tales. And Well, to us it's ridiculous, but how about to the people who don't know the truth, the people who are their students in those universities the, who are not Christians, not yet, and they're, they're being exposed to this garbage. It's just polluting their mind 24-7. And uh, so it's a very sad thing. And, uh, you know, that's where Christians got to be ready to stand up. Because, like I say, we have the truth on our side. Why wouldn't we be bold about the truth? The truth that people don't even realize. If we could just explain it to them. Find a way of explaining it to them. That, yes, the evidence for Christ exists it has been proven in, in so many ways and i mean I, I work the information in to my sermons pieces in there because it's just so much information we're looking at a mountain of evidence on from so many disciplines from science philosophy archaeology um, linguistics manuscripts evidence and then you got the basic, you know, you got the prophecies. Well, it's irrefutable. You got the uh, the testimony of the the saints, the early church. You got the rapid growth of Christianity in the face of persecution. You got the um, <clears throat> the resurrection, the empty tomb. I mean, we got it all on our side, okay. But the thing is, um, people need to know that. We have the truth and that it's okay if the world doesn't get it. Um, we need to be able to stand up to that. You don't need what the world, we're not buying what the world is selling. Put it that way. Uh, not when you found Christ, you found something far greater. And um, finding Christ is what it's really all about. It's, um, it's just that simplicity of uh, putting your faith in Jesus Christ, making that decision to follow Christ, making the decision to give your life to Christ to live for Jesus Christ rather than live for the world. Okay, once you make that decision, then you need to follow up with it and um, start to grow as a Christian. You do that through good disciplines, Bible study, prayer, fellowship, fasting, ministry, um, and many more. Just good habits like that that we get into as Christians. And uh, get to where you can uh, learn 
the Bible. And uh, so you got to study the Word of, of God seriously, learn the Bible, learn what the doctrines are, what it is that we believe, and uh, why we believe it, and then be able to explain that to others with gentleness and respect. And uh, so let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for this sermon, and please help us, God, to come to Christ and to... Uh, to uh, have a good relationship with Jesus Christ, a saving relationship with Christ. And for those that don't know Christ, please just break down any barriers that would be holding them back and uh, draw them to, uh, to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and let us, let us share in the salvation in Christ. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.